All right, we are live. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 89 of Global Citizens. And after a certain period, brief period of time, this is actually I. This is actually the first time in a while, but I actually have two episodes in a week. So before we begin, I actually want to send an apology in advance to those who is fasting. Uh, happy Eid Mubarak to you guys. Uh, because we will be doing this for a certain period of time, myself and my guests will have to drink. We sincerely apologize in advance. We don't want to offend you, but we do still need to drink because we will have be having a long conversation. So my guest for today is Mr. Andrew McGeehan. I hope I'm saying it correctly. Uh, yes. Andrew is passionate about social issues and finding ways to make the world a more accountable, equitable, and inclusive space. His career and in education has allowed him to work with students and administrators on issues ranging from supports for trans students in universities to leading a peer educator group to educate and provide prevention efforts around sexual misconduct. So he began the Trident training and consulting in 2021, which is this year. With these issues in mind, uh, Trident focuses on creating tailored responses, workshops, and training related to issues of sexual misconduct, diversity and inclusion, and professional development. So without further ado, I'll pass the platform back to Andrew. How are you, Andrew? Hi, uh, thanks so much for having me and for uh, bringing me onto the show. Um, I'm doing great. It's a rainy morning here in Singapore. Um, so I'm looking forward to this conversation and being able to share some of my thoughts um, around these topics, which as you've just mentioned, are super important to me um, and hopefully important to everybody who's listening. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, Andrew, uh, my first question is actually on the name of your company. Uh, yeah. I deal with intercultural related issue. So most of the time that I see the symbol is having something to do with wings or planes or flights. The re and, and, uh, and the theme has also been on ruthlessness. But why is the name of your company is starts with Trident, something which has related to the sea? And also, what was the idea when you were creating Trident Consulting? Yeah, so the name, uh, I went through many iterations of name development. If anyone has uh, tried to start their own business, you know that this is like the biggest thing. I felt like I couldn't do anything until I had a name. Um, Trident actually came to me when I was on vacation uh, back in the days when you could go on vacation a couple of years ago. I had always thought, oh, maybe it'll just come to me in the middle of the night. And it actually did. I woke up and I was like, oh, what about Trident? Um, and the reason that it sort of felt like it really stuck is that I have always been really sort of enamored by the sea. Um, I also have always really been into like uh, Greek gods and Poseidon was always my favorite. Um, I have a huge like Poseidon uh, tattoo here, which you can sort of see. Um, oh, that's cool. So, yeah, this was pre pre Trident the company, um, but it sort of all just seemed to work. And then because I knew that I was sort of thinking about focusing on three areas, which were sexual misconduct, um, diversity and inclusion, and professional development, I thought, oh great, Trident the sort of uh, oh imagery sort of has like three prongs. I have, you know, a three sort of focus areas that I really want to hone in on. Um, and I wanted something that also was like, from a sort of more business perspective, I wanted something that, oh, it'll roll off your tongue easily. Um, even if you forget the name of it, you might remember the sort of imagery that's associated with Trident and you might be like, oh, it's something oceany. Um, so that is sort of what I was thinking. But then I think it also just connected to my sort of personal love of like, um, the ocean uh, and sea creatures. I have several other like sort of sea creature tattoos. Um, yeah, so it just all seemed to work for me. So that was where the name came from. Um, and then the idea behind it was really, um, it was actually uh, an idea that was given to me by somebody else. Um, so I had done some training. I was previously working at Yale and US College in Singapore for uh, five and a half years. And I had done some training for um, the NUS team, the main NUS campus. And they had said, someone had said to me afterwards, like, oh, well, it's too bad that you're working, um, you know, basically for for NUS already, um, because if not, we would have, like, paid to bring in, like, an outside trainer like you to, like, do this for us. Um, and they were like, oh, so if you have, like, a consultancy, like, you know, we would have uh, paid for this. And I was like, huh, what if I did have my own consultancy, though, um, which is not something I'd ever considered for myself. 
Um, I've been working in higher education for 10 years. I sort of thought, yeah, I'll just keep doing this. I'm going to be dean of students one day, and then I'll just, you know, have this like life working with students, which I do love. Um, but then that that just sort of got the ball rolling, and that would have been like at least two years before Trident even came into existence. So then I just started thinking, and as it became clear that my time at Yale and US um, that I that I was coming to the end of my time, that I felt it was time to uh, move on and to try something different. Um, I thought, well, this seems as good a time as ever. Um, around that time, there was a lot of conversation in Singapore around sexual misconduct and diversity and inclusion. Several um, controversial <laughs> things that happened. Um, Monica Bay case was very big. Um, there was a brown face incident. Um, there was just sort of a lot that was happening. And so I thought, you know, it seems like maybe I have something that could be useful for people in the context that I happen to be in. Um, yeah, and so that's basically how it started. And I went through all of the uh, fun processes of applying for an AP and setting up a company. And I've learned many things about Accra and Core Pass and Sing Pass. <laughs> and there's a lot, a lot, a lot of different um, things you have to sign up for. Um, so <laughs> I've learned a lot about that. But eventually, the company uh, went live. My EP was approved, and then I'm here now, uh, four months in. Okay, could have told me. My sister actually helped out with all this kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Okay. To know. Yeah, next time, next time, maybe, maybe next time. Uh, actually, uh, there's actually one more part that you can add on to your team. Uh, there was a phrase before. I think it come from the anime One Piece. Uh, every one of us is the children of the sea. So you can add on to that to one of your own marketing is that. Every one of us is just the same. Uh, maybe there's a maybe we have a different way of viewing things, or maybe we have a different sexual orientation. But at the end of the day, we all are just humans, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that is part of my inspiration. I, I one of my other tattoos that I alluded to before is like a stingray, um, which is my right. favorite sea creature. Uh, but also, I had wanted something that sort of symbolized the fact that like if you trace everything back at the end of the day, we all came from the ocean, like. Without the ocean, there would be no humanity. There would be no life. Um, so I do think there's a lot of great sort of symbolism connected to this shared, you know, e even though it's like obviously hundreds of thousands, millions of years ago, there is this sort of shared commonality we have and that we did all emerge from, you know, ooze, basically. We're going to became, you know, yeah. who are today talking, talking like internationally. Um, yeah, so I do think that's also an element of my um, thinking about uh, Trident. I'm not necessarily convinced that all of my clients necessarily like make all those connections when they're deciding to work with me. Um, for a lot of people, I think it's like, oh, it's easy. Okay, I get it. Trident, free. Yep, sure. Um, <laughs> but for me personally, I feel like, oh, there's also these layers to it that, you know, if, if you wanted to uncover, you could, but you don't necessarily have to. Fair enough, fair enough. Uh, okay, I actually had a similar idea when coming up with my with my own podcast name, but that's another time. Yeah. Okay, uh, Andrew, yeah. So for those of you who are just tuned in to this for the very first time, Global Citizens is an online weekly live stream that whereby I invited people who has experienced this kind of intercultural life. Primarily, we actually focus on advocating the third culture kids because, well, I am one, so I'm openly biased to it. But along with that, though, I want to represent the global platform, the global mindset, and the global citizens of any kind of platform. Along with that, we also have been representing issues that people may not be too comfortable in approaching because of a mindset that is too conservative or in the past may have been considered taboo. Like for example, recently we've been advocating on the on speaking up on the anti-Asian hate movement. This is actually the video link to the Try Guys video about it. I openly share it is because I love the explanation. I love the fair mindset. And Along with Andrew and my previous guest, uh, Mr. Roy Gokai Wall, we actually will be representing the LGBTQ community. I've been wanting to have this this the vo a voice on this area for quite a while, but I have not been able to do that, and I don't think it is my right to say anything on that since, uh, respectfully, I am not a member of the LGBTQ community. However, there are third culture kids who are members of it, and I've been wanting to have a voice in it. So 
it's been really it's been really a great blessing to have both Andrew and Roy for this week. All right, uh, I'll pass the platform back to Andrew. So yeah, uh, how long have you been living in Singapore, Andrew? And along with that, what do you feel has been the best blessing about it in either the U.S. or in Singapore? in handling the diversity related area and of course lgbtq related lgbtq related method in handling it okay um that's a lot let me see if i'll remember to get all <laughs> if i forget um so uh, I, I actually have an easier way to say it but the thing is is that i just don't want to make people misunderstand oh my god are you insulting any of these two no guys guys i love singapore deeply deeply i grew up there for over 10 plus years and uh i well i don't like the race one of the past president recently but that's another story but yeah. i've always have i've always wanted to be i've always wanted to try living in the u.s for God knows how long, because I've always been enamored by the the, the, the vibrant culture and the open mindset that has been shown in the U.S. So yeah, so Andrew. Okay, well I'll do my best then. Uh, so I've been in Singapore for almost six years. Um, it'll be six years in July. Previous to that, I was in the U.S. for um, almost all of my life. I'd had a few sort of stints um, working in small places abroad um, or small time frames. Um, but not as big as sort of full-on moving my life somewhere like I did when I came to Singapore. Um, and in the U.S., I lived in seven different states. So I, I ranged from in the middle of the city uh, in Seattle to like outskirts of Los Angeles. And then when I came here, I was in small town Massachusetts in Western Mass, um, which is a small town, but also well known for being uh, extremely uh, progressive and, and liberal. It's where um, Amherst College and Smith and Mount Holyoke are. Um, so it sort of has a, a different vibe than some other small towns in the U.S. Um, when I think about intercultural life in Singapore and the U.S., I do think they're very different. Um, I think some of the... So in the U.S., I think there is a sense... Um, so I think actually in both places, I think there is a sense a lot of time from sort of the privileged groups or the dominant um, group, especially in terms of racial identity, um, that there are no issues or that like everything is like basically working as, you know, functions. There are just like small hiccups here and there. But what I understand from people I know in Singapore and in the U.S. is that actually those systems, the, the smooth functioning of many systems actually is sort of reinforces um, racist stereotypes or reinforces um, racial profiling in like different kinds of ways. Um, so I think it's very interesting. When I first came to Singapore, I was sort of, surprised as I was learning what the cultural context was. Um, and you hear about like um, CMIO and that kind of stuff. I was like, oh, I don't, wait, there's only four races or four ethnicities or, or what is it that they actually mean? <laughs> four nationalities? Um, okay, I guess I'm other, which is fine. Um, but like, four what is that? Four ethnicities. Uh, there's yeah. a monument for that actually, guys. Actually, it's the Singapore, uh, in Singapore that represents that. Uh, it's the Malays, Indians, Chinese, and the, and the Caucasian. Yeah, um, so I found that interesting. Um, and then you hear about things um, like racial quotas in public housing that you're like, as an American, I'm like, <gasps> um, you would never be able to <laughs> like do that kind of thing in America. But then you hear the explanation for it here. Oh, it's to encourage mingling. Okay, that sounds okay. But then you hear from people on the ground. Well, it just encourages people are in a space. It doesn't necessarily encourage mingling specifically, like you sort of would hope. Um, but because sometimes of dominant systems, like people still don't necessarily like mingle together. Um, and then you hear about racial harmony day and all these things in the U S what's interesting is they, there is a perception that like things are mostly fine between different racial groups, even though it's clearly not. Um, but they never say it out loud from like that kind of perspective. So like th there's not racial harmony day in the U S, um, there is, I think, sort of a wider spectrum of the amount of sort of races or ethnicities that exist there. Um, so I think it is, I think, uh, I, I love the phrase same, same, but different. So to a certain extent, they are same, same, but different um, between Singapore and the US. I think the manifestation of it is what I find is the most different. Um, and for instance, in the US, when I was living in Seattle, I had a very different kind of experience um, 
Then I also had a stint in a uh, small town, Maine, which was a very small town, um, predominantly sort of white, you know, straight middle-class people. Um, and so I have noticed for me that that kind of difference um, really in the US because it's so big, it can really vary a lot. So for instance, basically everyone I knew when I lived in Maine was white. Um, I barely knew any people who were not white. Whereas in Seattle, I barely had any friends that were white. Um, everyone, I was in grad school there. Um, everyone, most people in my cohort were like people of color, like everybody was queer. It was just like super fun, um, like interesting environment, but it was such a different experience to have a life that was predominantly, um, like also with predominantly white people and, and not. Um, in Singapore, I think because it's so much smaller, the sort of demographics are, are more similar, like everywhere around the island. Um, e even though like there will be places where there's more or less people, you know, I live in Tantra Pagar, so like you know, a lot of white people there, um, <laughs> a lot of expats there. Um, so it is slightly different, but it's not in the sense that like, oh, I live in Tantra Pagar and I like literally never see uh, a Chinese Singaporean, an Indian Singaporean, a Malay Singaporean. Whereas in the US, you could literally live somewhere and be like, I never see black people in my day-to-day -day life. I never see Asian people. And it would be true. like. That, that could happen. Whereas in Singapore, it's not possible. Um, yeah. So I find that very interesting. Right. Now, just to balance that out though, what do you feel though within any of these two countries that you feel could be more facilitative to actually represent the either the diversity and inclusion related area or in the LGBTQ community? I mean, as I said, I love Singapore. I grew up there most of my life. But there are certain times that whereby I just feel that the rule is just too stringent. And they ju I just feel that in a certain community, sometimes may not be able to feel that they are being supported. And in fact, that everything is against them, even in their own home. Uh, I've had a lot of guests who either are citizens of the United States or have well or have lived in the united states and so and they always have a mixed feelings about that but the thing is is that even if they're at the end of the day is that unless you belong in the big city you are you always feel excluded in areas that may not be uh, acknowledging diversity mm -hmm. yeah i think that we struggle a lot sometimes to see sort of shared humanity in others. And I think, you know, for me, I'll always say, well, maybe not always, I do think it is important depending on the cultural context to change the sort of systems that are in place that specifically disenfranchise people. Um, so in America, you have like Anti-Discrimination Act. Um, does it mean that discrimination stopped happening? No, of course not. Um, but is it a symbolic, Thing to have that act even exist as law. Um, yes, I think so. And different identities, you know, get added to it at different times. Um, I think in Singapore, sometimes the challenge is that there's, aside from 3778, there's not a lot of laws that directly sort of create systems that might feel discriminatory, say for LGBTQ people. But in practice, they are. So for instance, housing, right? Um, you know, it doesn't say, oh, a, a gay Singaporean can't uh, buy an HDB, but you can't until you're 35 and then you only have access to certain ones. And perhaps in the meantime, you need, to, you have no choice except to live with your family and maybe they are not accepting or maybe you can't come out to them. So, there, so in practice, it does actually disempower um, LGBTQ citizens in Singapore, even though on paper, the law doesn't say, oh, gay people can't buy houses. It's that all these other systems that are in place, if you're not married, you know, if you're not married, you can't buy until you're 35. Is uh, same-sex marriage legal? No, therefore gay people can't get married. So the, the link is there, but it's not explicitly spelled out. So I think that that is something that is really hard to deal with because it gives plausible deniability to anyone to say, oh, well, there is no discrimination. Like, yeah, you can still buy a house. And it's like, okay, right. But waiting until you're 35 and then getting like only, I, I forget all the details because HDB is like exceedingly complicated. Um, and it's really expensive, by the way. Uh, 
like unless you're a Singapore citizens, the if you take a bank loan, it will take like one point six percent interest. But if you use your your central Providence fund, you kind of have it's double the interest. Uh, yeah, I kind of remember that full detail on that because I actually was asking about this recently. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's interesting. I think in that respect, and and again in the U.S., I think it's hard because it's so big um, that, you know, when I'm in Seattle, yes, it felt very free and open and you could sort of be who you were. And, and Seattle had been known as sort of like counterculture, you know, so no one really cared. Um, but did that mean that like hate crimes didn't happen? Um, prejudice discrimination didn't happen? No, of course not. Um, it was still present. And actually very sadly, once, um, once Amazon and Microsoft and Boeing became very big in Seattle, the percentage of hate crimes actually went up by like 100% plus like a few years ago um, because it was this injection of sort of, um, <laughs> I don't know how to describe it, injection of people who are working for those companies who maybe were sort of like, maybe would have a stereotype of being like a tech bro that was like not very um, open. And so it was really sad to see these places that were like previously so like you know, vibrantly queer and counterculture um, be sort of uh, infiltrated by like a lot of like straight white people basically who wanted to like make the space theirs and then like be upset that there was a lot of queer people around when they were like literally in the gay neighborhood um, and to have to watch like hate crimes go up. Whereas that kind of thing doesn't happen as much in Singapore. I think that's a huge difference between the two is that in Singapore, I don't feel like there are nearly as many threats if any, well, of course, there's always a threat, but like to physical safety, I feel like it's a very different kind of um, maybe psychological safety or like sort of unease um, sometimes. But you're very unlikely in Singapore to walk down the street and have somebody yell a racial slur at you or call you an offensive name for an LGBTQ person. Whereas in the US, like that, <laughs> that could happen even in the big cities. Um, you walk down the street, someone yells the F word, someone calls you this or that. Like, so I think that's a, something I grappled with a lot when I came here, as I was like, oh, so interesting. I feel safe, but then also sometimes not safe. Um, I used to like get my nails painted sometimes, and I would always catch like aunties on the bus and stuff, really like giving me the stare down if they could see that I had like blue nails or something, um, which maybe I'd get in the US as well. Um, so it's just interesting to see the different kinds of reactions. Uh, and I think that that is sort of cultural in terms of the ways that people respond to things that they're not accepting of in public, for instance, in a public forum. Sure. Okay. Yeah, that was a bit of a tangent, but yeah, that's just, that's what, what was coming to mind. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's good. That's good, man. That's good. Okay. Uh, can I ask though, how is the method, what method would, would are you using to actually impart uh awareness on this on diversity uh equity uh the lgbtq community when you are actually discussing it with your client when you are approaching the method is because singapore has always been pro-conservative i mean even with it being a melting pot of cultures there's still going to be people in power who could be resistant to change is because well this is what they know growing up. This is what they understand growing up. But as part of a big organization, maybe they have to adhere to it. And well, time has changed. Time is changing now. For one thing is that uh, for the past year, we can't actually be in an office to work. With, like coming out, being having a drink is just at one point become a privilege. And a lot of a lot of things that was pent up actually now came up to the surface and now people are more aware of it but there will be those who are resistant to these changes so what are the methods that trident consulting has actually been used to actually deal with this particular area when you are working with your clients yeah um that's such a good question that's something that keeps me up on night <laughs> i'm like okay because even in my previous roles, I did lots of DNI work at schools and did lots of trainings and stuff. And sometimes I'll just wake up, like you know, in a panic and be like, "Have I made anything better for anyone?" <laughs> like if there is a sense sometimes of like, "Did I even do anything?" Like uh, I, I felt the same way. I felt the same way. And in fact, I think until my first 10th episode, I really feel is that 
am I really helping somebody with this thing or this is just only for me? So I get that, I get that, I get that. Yeah, so it's hard to deal with sometimes and, and the, the, the sort of positive feedback around that comes so few and far between. Um, I do get students who reach out to me years later to say, oh yeah, I do with the first person who talked to me about white privilege and like 10 years later, I finally get it. And I'm like, great, that's amazing. Um, but that doesn't happen like all the time. Um, I think for me, something I try to really impart when I do my training is that um, you, me, everyone, we are judgmental, we are biased, we are racist, we are sexist. We, like, that's what I try and get across a lot is that like we focus too much on not wanting to be those things that we can't recognize that we already are. Like I was raised in a male dominated patriarchal society. I am sexist. I just am. Like I can, I do my best to unlearn that, to understand better like uh, what issues are for women and other gender minorities, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I think that's something I always try and impart is that like, if you have thought a sexist thing before or thought a racist thing before, you are not a terrible person. You are a product of the society that you're brought up in. And I think, especially in the US, you see this, people are so individualized that they're like, no, 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 not me. I was not influenced by society. And I always try and tell people like, no, you were. Um, so was I. When we pretend that all of our thoughts and opinions are solely our own, I think that's a huge barrier. So I try and start with that. That like you've done it said racist things if you're part of the majority and um that's okay so what we want to work towards is recognizing when we have those thoughts and trying to interrogate where they are coming from and try and think oh where did we learn that oh is that actually my experience with um you know with indian singaporeans or with malay singaporeans is that actually what i've experienced or is it something that happened once or twice but because i just don't have as much data points then that's the reason why I'm feeling a certain kind of way around this. Um, and so sort of, I always think about with driving. So in the US, there's stereotypes that women and uh, Asian identified people are bad drivers. And well, I always- it's, uh, Okay, I need to add something to that. It's not that we are bad drivers. We have bad roads and we all, and we are at where we are at. You guys can, oh, you guys can go to my house in Indonesia. The roads are incredibly tiny and I am really terrified a lot of times that my car is going to crash into something. So no, <laughs> we are not bad drivers, but we are born in bad roads. Yeah. That's, the, exactly that's right. the thing. Well, what I always tell people is like, it's actually not true that like women and Asian people are worse at driving than anyone else. It's that you notice it more when you are cut off by an Asian person or a woman because you already have that stereotype in mind and because there's just more white male drivers on the road. So you don't, you don't build a pattern about it when you see them do it because you see them do it all the time. Um, so I think it's like recognizing like where do some of these things come from? Um, so that I think is like one really big method. I think the second one um, even though it sounds a little trite, like it really is empathy building. Like there's so much research that says like, we don't care. Actually a great example is like ability status. No one cares anything about ability status until they have a parent who becomes a wheelchair user. And then they're like, oh my God, the world is not set up for so much. And it's like, well, it was always not set up like that. But we just recognize it when it impacts us personally. And so I try and do whatever I can to develop that empathy. Um, so for instance, I did a training recently that was around gender diversity um, for a school. And I really like found some really great media clips about trans students talking about their experience in school and what would have been helpful and what would have not been helpful. And I thought that that was really impactful for the group because they got to actually hear it. So it's not just me saying, oh, I've read all this research and now I'm summarizing it for you because I'm not trans identified. Um, so I didn't think, you know, I, I, I can't, I can, I can learn a lot, but I can't speak from the direct experience. So, so using things like that, I think to try and develop empathy. And that's why having like a variety of trainers, having people come in who have different identities to talk to you, who can also say, you know, as it's relevant, this is also my life. Um, you know, this is what happens to me on a daily basis. Like, I think it just makes it real. So I think making it real is another one of my methods, like uh, methods, yeah, making it sort of clear that it's happening to real people. You know, racism on the MRT towards Indian and Malay Singaporeans isn't happening like out there somewhere. Like here is someone, not me of course, but like someone who can talk about it um, and who has actually experienced that. And I think that just makes it more real. So I think those are probably 
most of the methods that I use. And I very much, so I was saying before, sometimes the students reach out years later, I very much subscribe to the seed planting method. So I'm like, if you leave my training and you're like, he was garbage, that was all wrong, social justice warrior, nonsense, victimizing, you know, there's no prejudice. Um, that's fine. I'm like, I'm totally okay with that because the seed was planted. And I would, I always like to think that people like that who, who walk away from a training or workshop thinking that they will complain about it to somebody else. And maybe that somebody else is going to be like, oh, actually some of the points that that trainer raised are actually right. Um, maybe you should think about them more. So that's what I like to think. Like you complain about something you hate, but then maybe you also get challenged by somebody in your life. So then that still creates a good conversation. And I fully understand because I came from, you know, I'm like white, cisgender, male, American. So I, I have a ton of privilege. Um, and I try to also remember what helped me grow and what helped me be more understanding. Um, because of course there were times where I also, you know, I didn't, I wasn't born woke. So I think I had many times also in my life where I see, you know, you know, those memes that you always see, like, oh, I'm cringing because I thought of something I said 15 years ago. Like, I think that all the time about things I may have said um, around uh, like sexism issues or racism issues or, or, or minimizing issues and being like, oh, well, I, you know, I'm part of the queer community. So like, I totally get it when like, actually I didn't get it because it was a different, uh, it was a different experience. Um, I think as long as we can sort of chart our own growth journeys and then also share that with people, I think that helps as well. Okay. Yeah, that's yep. That's a good one, my friend. That's a good one. Okay. Uh, I actually want to ask though, for those who might not be undergoing your training at the moment, yeah, mm -hmm. what could they do to actually be much more sensitive with with difference in race or color or even on the LGBTQ community? And if you don't mind, please explain to us though, because in your name there's a bracket with a he or a, a slash him. I actually, in order to prepare for the two episodes that deal in the LGBTQ community, I actually need to reach out to some of my alumni and even some of my contacts because I don't want any kind of false representation and I don't want any kind of fair misunderstanding. So. If you don't mind, maybe you can explain to us, like, for example, what can people who may not go through your training and those who already, as what you said, they grow up in their certain generation. So how could they be more understanding if, let's say, they do accidentally make a mistake when they are, approach when they are approaching topics related to race or gender or culture or even the LGBTQ community? Yeah. That is a great uh, series of questions. Um, I think the first thing is to identify your own mindset. So to me, do you want to learn or do you not? I say, if you don't want to learn, um, then just don't comment on it. <laughs> you don't like what somebody's wearing or you don't approve of someone's sexual orientation, like just don't say anything about it. Um, don't confront them about it. Like, it, you know, what, what's the impact to you? It doesn't really matter, right? Um, sometimes that's what I will bring it back to is like, does this impact you on a daily basis? No. Or if it does, start examining, like, why are you so bothered? Um, like, why is it bother you if like you see like two men or two women or trans people like just existing happily? Um, so I think if you don't want to learn, just don't bother with it. Just, just don't make offensive comments, you know, don't be like, I don't understand your lifestyle. I don't like, just don't, don't do that. Um, if you do want to learn, I think there's so many different ways to learn. So I think it would depend on a learning style. Like, there's so many books out there. You know, you can Google like books about the trans experience and there are amazing books um, that you can read on that. So maybe reading is a way that helps you sort of connect or maybe it's a biography of a trans person that helps you be like, okay, this in-depth story for one person helps me develop the empathy. Um, maybe you don't like that. So then seek out uh, media. Um, you can watch all sorts of things now that have lots of uh, queer characters in them, um, characters of different races and ethnicities. Think about you know, what shows or movies have you heard of that really delve into these issues? Um, so people look at like, um, all my examples are gonna be very US based, so, so apologies in advance, but people oh, look at like, Orange, yeah, people look at Orange is the New Black, people look at sex education, um, people look at, uh, uh, what else is a good one? Uh, Modern you know, Family? Modern Family, sort of, I would say, <laughs> Questionable. Uh, <laughs> yeah. In terms of, uh, in terms of representation, but it represents. 
Lee, I haven't watched, so I couldn't I couldn't uh, okay, mention it. But maybe, yeah. Um, but even something like RuPaul's Drag Race, if you're like, ah, I understand drag queens, like, you know, drag race can be extremely touching um, as the queens talk about, like, what it means for them to, like, you know, sort of engage in this art form. Um, so if that's something that you learn more from and you're like, oh, I like to watch it, I want to see these human stories, I want to see the internet, Tales of the City is another good one, um, then that's something that you can do. So I think it really depends on, like, whether or not you're willing to learn more. Um, and I th and I say you should do all of that before you just, you know, come into random contact with someone of a different identity and start asking them a million questions. Um, we don't always love that. Um, and of course it depends on the context and it depends on the motivation for building a relationship. So I think if you're like, oh, I need to go make an Indian friend so I understand the Indian experience better, that's not great. That's gonna feel very tokenizing. But if you make friends and you know, have members of your family who have different identities and you are like getting to know them because you are friends and you just like want to learn about those kinds of things and you don't shut down those conversations, that's actually how you learn a lot. Um, I've learned so much about the experience of being a racial minority in Singapore from my friends who are racial minority Singaporeans um, who are very open and willing to talk with me. And also because I am not someone who's gonna be like, oh no, you're just making it up. Oh no, that's not your experience. Um, so then, uh, so thinking about something else that you said about like making accidental mistakes, I think for me, the most important thing is that if someone says, oh, hey, actually that word's really offensive, um, I'd prefer if you don't say it in front of me, literally the best response is, oh, if you didn't know that, I didn't know that. If you did know that, say, oh, thanks for reminding me. And then um, that's it. I won't use it again in front of you, right? It's not, oh, well, you're just being sensitive. Oh, well, you know, this other friend that I have who has the same identity doesn't care. It's like, just listen and be like, okay. And if you are confused about why it's offensive, if you have a good relationship with that person, you can ask them. And if not, literally just Google, why is, quote, word I said, offensive? And you'll find stuff. And again, you don't have to agree. I think I, I've done trainings on inclusive language before, like, you're trying to police what I say. And I always say, no, I'm not. I'm trying to give you, or not trying, what I want is to give you the context of the words that you're using, so that if that is indeed the word you're choosing to use, you are now informed um, that it might be hurtful. You can choose to still use it. But I, if I hear it in front, you know, if you use it in front of me, I know that you've been informed that it's hurtful and so then I'm gonna question why you're going to continue using a word that has been informed to you that it's hurtful. Um, and then the last thing that you mentioned about the the sort of the he, him and the pronouns. Um, so that's something that has become um, quite uh, popular recently, I think especially with Zoom um, and also in emails. Um, so uh, I did write a blog on this called why are my pronouns in my emails? But in general, it's basically just to um, share with others how they can refer to you. And so we often think of um, only people who might be trans identified or using different kinds of pronouns aside from he, him, and she, her, um, as people who need to share that. And I think it's part of an effort to normalize that we just share this. Um, and it allows people who might be using um, different pronouns, so someone says, oh, I go by he or they, or I only use they, them pronouns. Um, it allows them to share that um, one, without needing to tell a million people. So if you go to like a Zoom staff meeting and you're like, okay, I've put it here. Now I don't need to tell each individual person, oh, my pronouns are now they and them. Um, but when it normalizes it, it also makes it, it just makes it clear that like, we all have pronouns and we can all share them with people because I think it helps on a subtle level to sort of disentangle like assumption making. Um, so yes, I understand someone's going to look at me and read me as male um, because of my physical appearance and my beard and my general hairiness. Um, but maybe I do use they, them pronouns. And so it's, it's, it's about a subtle way of like disrupting, just making assumptions about people. Um, and in my previous work, I've known lots of people who use they, them pronouns or who use multiple kinds of pronouns. Um, and if I was stereotyping them, I would not have thought that based off of their appearance. And so it's about like sort of disentangling those kinds of things and just being more aware um, that there are more expressions of identity besides just he, him, she, her, and that's it. Okay, yeah, that's fair enough, that's fair enough. Albert Einstein once said that logic is culmination of negative experience 
that was gathered from the age of until the age of 18. I think this is a uh, with this is an era of change in this 2021 is that a lot of things that we thought is just something that we can just pass by or in the past it was acceptable now it's not well you have there need to be a lot more awareness of it and there needs to be a lot of lessons on it people want to say oh you strawberry generations are being woke no we are not being woke we are trying to rectify a certain mindset that prevents harm or in the long run mm -hmm. i don't know if what i don't know if it's your art you was it you who posted it or was it it's something you researched on your linkedin i actually saw an article about a bunch of chill bunch of kids who are trans in singapore and their teach their teachers is it well was it was it somebody who is their senior as actually trying to tell them is that there's nothing wrong with you but the thing is is that the whole world at least for until a brief period of time until you are an adult will not be accepting of you so this is really really depressing to see that is because sometimes may they may not choose to be this way but they are born this way what are you going to do you cannot just tell them hey you need to change you need to be like everybody else come on guys this is no this is 2021 already it's really yeah. it's really really time whereby people need to i i don't want to be cliche but you really need to wake the hell up you really need to wake the hell up yeah and it's testament to the strides that have been made that they that people can even talk about these things semi-openly I think I've, I've seen things that are like, um, even with sexual misconduct, I saw something on the Singapore Reddit that was sort of like, oh, why has there been an increase in sexual misconduct? And it's like, actually there hasn't been. There's been an increase in people advocating enough that people feel more empowered to report it when it happens. Um, that's not what has changed. The instances probably have not changed, sadly. Um, and it's the same with different kinds of identity. Um, we can feel more empowered now to be like out as LGBTQ people, um, as trans people, as queer people, because others have sort of paved that way for us and things are like better, even if they're not good or great, depending on where you are and what your identity is. And so, yeah, I think it's a good thing. It's not that, you know, sometimes you see like think pieces that are sort of like, why is everyone trans all of a sudden, or there's all of a sudden 500 genders and it's like, no, that's not true. There was always that, that always existed. Trans people have always existed. Um, queer people have always existed. It's just that now, in, you know, in certain places there's laws that might protect certain identities, but it just allows people to be more open. Um, so it's a bit sad, yeah, to hear if people say like, oh, well, your life is gonna be hard. It sort of was like, well, yeah, that's true, but like each individual person can start that by like combating those kinds of things in their own life. I, when I was preparing for a gender diversity training, I found a great quote that basically said like, you know, trans people are not negatively impacted by their identity. They are negatively impacted by people's response to their identity. And sometimes we think of it as like, oh, you're queer, oh, it's so hard for you. And it's like, no, it's actually not. My queer identity is not what's hard for me. It's the fact that other people respond negatively, deny me rights, um, you know, want to see me put down. That's what's hard. <laughs> Actually, living as a queer person is like wonderful and lovely, um, but it's other people who are doing that. So then, if that, you know, it, once you can understand that, then it's like, okay, what steps can I take in my life to make other people's lives more comfortable? I, well, <clears throat> uh, well, we all are not perfect human. I mean, we can like, we can dislike somebody, but. If that has happened, we judge them based on their character, on who they are, not because of their sexual orientation or their skin color. That is that is just ridiculous. Why would we if they are born this way, why can we blame why do we have to blame them to be this way? But if they are dick, then yeah, you are a dick. There's no way to change that. That's something that the person have to do to improve on their character, right? All right, uh, yeah, this is going to be my last question for you, Andrew. Uh, sure. 
what would you suggest though for the young generations of LGBTQ who could be growing up in a culture that does not yet have the facility or the mind, the openness to actually accept this community because it's it's definitely not an easy thing. Uh, as I said, I actually gathered some of my alumni to actually ask them what is it that you guys went through because some of them are member of the LGBTQ community and there are a lot of times whereby they are in a culture that is too homogeneous and like if unless you're a boy or a girl you are not acceptable in fact if you being a half a uh, half a uh, mixed racial or bi nationality in fact it's already something that will already put like a scarlet letter on you it's mm -hmm. ridiculous this is not the time for that kind of mindset anymore but the thing is it still exists so may, yeah. for now we will just be focusing on the young generations of lgbtq who could be third culture kids themselves who are growing up in countries that may not be accepting of it so yeah what any suggestion for that andrew and anything you want to tell them yeah um it's such a difficult thing to talk about i think because it makes me like so sad um, like the, the article that you were referencing about like trans students in, um, in Singapore and their experience in school was really sad to read. I was so happy it was published because you never see stories like that. But reading it just made me realize, oh, okay, sometimes we think that there's so many great strides to make, but maybe we're still only like a, a little bit of the way there. Um, I think one suggestion I would always have is just to find your community. I think one of the hardest things about growing up as a queer person um, in any form is that you always think that you're alone, even if, well, not even if, you just always think that you're alone um, until you like really meet other queer people. So I think finding out where do those resources exist and depending on where you are in the world, those resources may exist only online. Um, there may be spaces that you can find either like on Facebook or Instagram or, um, I don't know, pr probably younger people know better ones than me, Discord, I don't know. Um, um, there's probably like ways to, or, or there are ways to connect with yeah, people. Yeah, we're too old, we're old already. <laughs> yeah, and, and that can help you feel like less alone just talking to someone. I know like a lot of times, you know, queer youth like don't see any role models of like queer people who are grown up, so sometimes like, they're not even sure what that can look like. Can you still be happy? Am I going to be, you know, sad forever? Um, so I think finding some of those connections um, is what's most, or maybe not most helpful, but I think can be really helpful. Um, I, I don't necessarily want to say like always live as your authentic self, though. I think that that's great. I think it's also not always safe, and so live as your authentic self. I would say within the safety confines that you're currently under, whether that's challenges with your family. Um, at school, um, you know, there's lots of talk about like schools that have uniforms and when students are trans, like, and they're forced into these uniforms, like what impact is that having on mental and emotional health and things like that. Um, yeah, so be yourself within sort of this, the, the safety confines that you have. Um, and I think just know that like, eventually you will be able to get to a place where you'll be able to meet other queer people in person. Um, you know, and, and develop like really good, I think sort of self-care strategies and recognize when it's becoming overwhelming for you. And I think being able to find, even if they're not queer, having like a couple of good friends who are your support system, who you can talk to about these things, who you're comfortable to share your identity with and who can be there for you. I think that makes a huge difference. Um, that can really help people survive um, challenging family situations, um, just knowing that there is someone that they can reach out to. Um, and of course, most places will also have different um, like hotlines, some queer related, some not, um, but just knowing that like there would always be resources if people were feeling like having suicide ideation or any ideas of self-harm um, due to their identity. Um, and some places now will even do like sort of like WhatsApp counseling or stuff so you can sort of like find ways to connect with people. Um, yeah, so I think that that is what's the most helpful. And I, I know that there are places where it can feel very um, isolating. And so I think finding any of those ways to sort of reach out um, it can just make like a huge difference. Um, I will like never underestimate the importance of having role models as well. So I also encourage people who are older um, LGBTQ people to 
within your safety confines, you know, be able to talk about your identity, be able to be open about it, to volunteer with different organizations that might um, that might like work with youth or work with other people, because like we also need to be present for the people that we. There's always that quote floating around, like be the person you needed when you were younger. Um, so I think about that a lot as like an older queer person, like how can I demonstrate like support for queer youth or how can I also like, be there for them or just be there as a resource or a listening ear. And that's why I found my work with students so fulfilling. Um, you know, they were college age, so they were adults, but um, I found that very fulfilling to work with queer and trans students. Um, so I think, yeah, it's, it's also our responsibility as people who have like sort of gone through some of it and come been out. There, done that, been there, yeah, done that kind of thing sort of done that i don't know you know we're all we're always still <laughs> yeah. who knows how it might change but people who have gone further in the journey to be able to support people who are still starting out in the journey i think is also super important all right all right that's all the question i have for today so thank you so much for those who tune in uh if you guys are interested to try something that is related to like what i'm doing a live stream or you guys want to make your own podcast uh, there's a link in the description box for $10 credit for StreamYard, which is the software I'm using. And you can also earn yourself a Canva credit when you create your own design for the e-cards and titles that I created to announce the episode. So last but definitely not least, I definitely want to thank Andrew for making the time to come here today. Uh, yeah, really appreciate what you are doing for this thing. Uh, is there anything else you want to say, Andrew? Uh, no, not really. Thanks so much for having me. And I hope that uh, folks who are listening are able to take something away um, from this. And of course, yeah, if you are um, local or international, you can always feel free to reach out to me if you have other questions about anything or uh, would want to work together. All right. Okay. Uh, some of the links for Andrew's social sites is already available in the description box. So other than that, this episode will be on replay on my Instagram TV. LinkedIn and on my YouTube channel, do check it out. So with that, that's the end of episode 89 of Global Citizens, inclusivity in 2021, conversation with diversity and inclusion consultant. Do take care everyone, enjoy your weekends or some of you could be at a different time slot or some of you could be on an earlier time slot. So please enjoy your Fridays or your upcoming Sundays. With that, uh, I'll bid you guys adieu. Bye.